and welcome to episode 69 of the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. I am Annabelle Bateman, your host, and today uh, I am talking with Jules Chandler. She's all the way from Bristol in the UK. Lovely to have someone from the UK on the show. And we're talking all about her, her Graves disease story, which is a long and twisted road to thyroid health. Uh, I know many of people that listen to this podcast have a range of different thyroid problems, and I think this conversation is going to be interesting and helpful regardless of what what type of thyroid problem you have. But I know that the Graves people out there uh, feel a little neglected sometimes. There's much more information about Hashimoto's. Uh, so I think particularly you're going to love this conversation. Um, Jules is pretty open about her her journey at and it was definitely has been an up and down road, but her grave story led her um, to go and study nutrition and become known as the thyroid expert. You'll hear the story about how that came about. And she now has gathered and she is a gatherer, gathered, gathered a whole team of thyroid professionals in the UK under the banner of the thyroid collective. And they are serving thyroid patients, not just across the UK, but all around the world. So you're going to want to listen to that. Jules is a gatherer of people. You'll really hear her heart for wanting to help people. And so, you know, you will have heard me talk from time to time about the importance of a thyroid support team. So we really go over that. So stay tuned, hang out. You're going to love this. It's a really fun conversation. Jules is a very high energy uh, person and yeah so sit back enjoy and I'll welcome Jules to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. This is fun to have you all the way from the UK all the way to us down here down under and all around the world where people are listening so welcome. Hello 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 thank you for getting in touch to organize this it's amazing. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, so this, I, I met Jules last week on a little um, little pre-podcast chat, a get-to-know-you chat, but I had been just Googling, really, to find thyroid experts from around the world that I could talk to on the show, and Jules's website is called The Thyroid Expert, but so I thought, who better to ask on a thyroid podcast than the thyroid expert. So I'm really looking forward to finding out how that came about. And uh, and obviously, we're going to dive into your thyroid story and the work that you have done with and for thyroid patients. But can you just give us a little bit of who is Jules Chandler? Little little intro. I know you're a high energy, fun person. So tell us a little bit about you. High energy, fun, and far too busy for my own good. It's just a bit much. It's that typical Graves character, isn't it? I'll just juggle 62 million plates all at the same time. But yeah, I've got a lot of hats. So I am a mummy um, and a dog owner and a cat owner and a wife now. Got married last year. I um, am a naturopathic nutritionist and I'm a holistic therapist as well. I've done a lot of body work over the years. I'm currently a full-time biomedical student, biomedical science student, and I lecture now and then at the College of Naturopathic Medicine, and I'm writing a book. (laughs) Of course, you are. Of course. 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 Your thyroid personality, (laughs) you, Jules. Really? I mean, at the moment, it's been quite nice, actually, uh, over the last year, because I started uni in September, and I, I do one thing. And I've never done that before. I've always done Ooh. lots of different things. Um, so I am just at uni and then I keep an eye on my business um, because I have an amazing team, which I think we're going to talk about as well. Mm, we are, definitely. Yeah. But I still check in with all the time. And so that's kind of fizzing away in the background. But uni is like my full time one thing, which is weird to have one thing. Yeah. And so currently you're on holidays like at the end so you finished one year of biomedical science is that right my first year uh, out of how many um i four but don't tell my husband because he thinks it's three (laughs) (laughs) all right jules's husband do not listen to this podcast don't listen don't listen yeah yeah okay so full-time uni student uh but on holidays at the moment, and instead of actually having a holiday, you're writing a book. 
Is that right? I am. Okay. I am. Do you want to talk about that now or do you want to, will we come back to that? Yeah, we can do. Well, tell um, us about so, your book. I, I'm all about thyroid books, as you know, having just written one. Um, but I think that yours and mine, the little I know of it, I think they're quite different. So please tell us about your book. Different. Yeah, what what yeah. is it? Who's it for? When are we going to be able to buy a copy? Tell us all the deets. Oh, God, the big question. When are we going to get a copy? Um, so this book is about six years in its concept old now <laughs> it's driving me nuts as you probably know as a book writer you i think everybody's got a book or six in them and this book came about six years ago when i was doing um we used to run a thyroid support group here in the uk and everyone would say oh if you, you, should, you should write a book you should write a book and i've just heard that for six, six years last six seven years really so I've tried to write it quite a few times and then a pandemic hit and then uni and then deferring uni to write the book during the pandemic. And that didn't really work for some reason or another. And so now um, it's the right time. Uh, try telling that to my brain because every time I sit down, as you know, Annabelle, yeah, Bateman, you get, I know it's hard. Really hard to write. And I even went to a book retreat for a week to break the back of it. And I came back with a crime novel. So that's <laughs> I think really. that's hilarious. <laughs> That's so oh, funny. This book, well, maybe we'll be reading me. the crime novel first. Can you just weave a few thyroid health might, things no. into that? <laughs> and you'll be two in one. Well, it will. It will get fed in. But it is a fiction, non-fiction, that one. It's very cool and I absolutely love it. But I've promised myself I'll write that next year. This year, this book is primarily for me. Um, sort of 14 years ago when I was first diagnosed and um, I, I don't know about you but when you first diagnosed all my all the thyroid books that I bought were launched across the room I was so frustrated at re having to read an entire book to get an understanding of this really complex issue and I just you literally used to just lob them email them, get get them from Amazon they'd be delivered within two hours they'd be lobbed so I always vied to write a book that was a bit silly but very serious, yeah. just unknotting the complexities of thyroid disease, all of them, graves, mm. hashy, everything. So this book has been born, I think we're about five chapters in, and I've even hand-drawn some of the stuff. It's all metaphors, analogies, there's no coaching in it uh at all because there's enough and there's a very very good book out called let's talk thyroid um, <laughs> and there is a lot of coaching in that so. <laughs> it's covered there's enough um so this is not a coaching book this is a your brain is fogged you can barely think about what your name is um short paragraphs hand-drawn pictures analogies and metaphors and that's the way I teach as well mm. I mean I teach endocrine and type 1 diabetes is a nightclub taxi situation so yeah anything could happen so it's really <laughs> so it's informational it's, it's trying to yeah. unravel the complexities of like thyroid physiology or the whole body is it all of that like trying to understand the anatomy of it the way the thyroid interacts yep. with the immune system and the you know every like Absolutely. all the different body parts I, mean, I didn't even know what it was did you when you got diagnosed no i don't even think i really no. knew till about i don't know 10 years ago <laughs> i was diagnosed 25 something years ago and i didn't yeah. all i was told was you'll be fine just you need, need to take a pill for the rest of you every day for the rest of your life and you'll be fine that's Absolutely. it i don't even exactly. i mean i was probably so brain fogged and I, I look back and I think I should have taken mum along to the appointment I, I think but I think I was being you know 22 and independent but really I should have taken her and she's a nurse and she would have really asked the questions but I just remember sitting in the car afterwards crying thinking I don't want to be on medication for the rest of my life but I don't think I, I don't have any conscious memory of understanding I, I don't I, it was a long time ago I just don't remember yeah well, we don't because we don't question, I don't know about you guys, but we don't question GPs in this country. We're so conditioned for them to go, here you go, take that for the rest of your life. And you don't ask any questions. Um, and what I've realized is GPs, as wonderful as they are, they're, they're trained to treat symptoms. Mm -hmm. ABC equals this medication, not 
A, B, C equals what's actually going on here? Is it fixable without medication? That's just not how it works. And uh, I was told I had, I wasn't even told I had Graves' disease, which is overactive thyroid. I was just told your thyroid's gone overactive. Take these pills for 18 months and we'll see what happens. I hadn't even sat down on the chair. So, how did, so let's step back a bit then, Jules. How did you get to be in the doctor's office thinking that, that there was a problem with your health? Like what, what in the lead up to being diagnosed with an overactive thyroid or what, what was going on in your life, your body that was telling you something's not right? Well, I'm a cliched postpartum diagnosis. So I had a six month old baby mm -hmm. at the time, but retrospectively, I knew I had it way before then. I was racing around like a maniac all of the time, high functioning, high stress. Uh, I would go running and my heart rate wouldn't go back to normal for 24 hours and I just would brush it off. Um, so I had loads of signs. Uh, I could eat whatever I wanted and stay pretty slim, never considered, never considered food. Um, I wish I'd really made the most of that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Now is a whole different, I mean, I'm really blessed because I'm under, I've been overactive and now I'm under up. So I've got, I've, oh, you've I've had that, you've had the, the, full had the, work, the full thyroid full experience. experience. Yeah. The full golden ticket. So, um, yeah, so there were a lot of signs there. And then I got pregnant. My baby was pretty small. She was um, six. Oh, I should really know that. Six eleven. Yeah, the second little. one was nine five. So uh -huh. that's, that's me stable. Nine mm. five. Scarlet, yeah, that's quite a big difference, seven. isn't it? Big difference. So sick uh, mama and stable mama. Yeah. Um, big difference. And they had i'd had a heart murmur in the past so they said we'll just check your heart six months postpartum to see um that everything's okay because they picked up a floppy valve initially when i was pregnant mm. um by the time i went back i'd gone into atrial fibrillation which is when your heartbeat is like a pinball machine <laughs> basically yeah wow. uh, i didn't know i was too busy having a baby and yeah. trying to, but I, you know, even then I was bouncing out of bed in the morning going, Hey, another day. Wow. Is here. You know, <laughs> who does that? that? You should have known that, then that this is not normal. I'm a new mom. And right. <laughs> I am have energy. Um, hmm, something is not right. And my pregnancy weight went. <laughs> so hmm. yeah, I shouldn't know really. Well, like, why would I have known? No, I you wouldn't. Well, how would you know? Well, we're not taught about exactly. thyroid health issues. Yeah. So, so I was, you know, pretty slim and a bit manic and then uh, had my heart checked again at the hospital they sent me straight to the doctors for bloods and that's when he said before I sat in the chair <laughs> slight resentment there yeah you you're overactive for thyroid here take this um, and these beta blockers and um, we'll monitor you but we'll take you off it in 18 months and see what happens so yeah off to the world of anti-thyroid medication I went and, and and that was it. I wish it was that simple. Yeah. Because it really was. No. Horrific. So how did you go? So you you went on. So so explain because I, I know a lot of the people that will be listening don't have graves. They'll have the Hashimoto's side. But I do know that there are a number of people that listen with graves too. But can you just explain like, because I, I think this is where there's a big difference between the medical treatment for graves and Hashimoto's. So yeah, it's huge. Can you explain the medication? Like, what were you put on? What's it meant to do? Gosh, what did you know it what? do? It's such an honour because I never get to talk about this stuff, and it is really massive. And and I was it's funny um, higher power moment, but I was exploring this yesterday in the book because I thought I want to really write a little bit about my journey and and qualify myself as a person who has been through it. So after that first day in the doctors, I just kind of pootled along and took the medications like a good little girl. And I was on uh, what's called a block and replace regime. So they block, yeah, they shut your thyroid down and then they put you on thyroxine. Oh, simultaneously. So take, yeah, but you can't go on thyroxine, obviously, the, um, until the carbimazole has stopped your thyroid working. So what's happening uh, biochemically is your brain is telling your thyroid to produce more energy. 
so it's like constantly seeing tigers everywhere let's go let's go let's go let's go let's go let's go so you've got all this energy and physiologically it's a nightmare because you're draining all of your nutrients all of the time so you know i had um i looked like bon jovi got mad my hair really thinned had to have it all cut off in the end my nails were breaking like there's literally nothing in the bank because your body is chewing it up that's why you lose weight so quick uh, your heart rate is going all the time. So you can't put thyroxine on top of that, obviously. So they give you the carbimazole to cage your thyroid. I like to think of it as cage. And it's like, mm. I want to create energy. But your thyroid can't because it's trapped and shut down. And in the meantime, the beta blockers just stop you from having a heart attack, basically. So they were part of the picture probably for the first six months. Once you're stable on carbimazole, so you're not above the range of T4 and T3, then they'll put, they basically drop you right down mm -hmm. so that you're barely functioning, and then they'll put the thyroxine in to replace. Right, so they turn you high, very high po. Is that what you're saying? You go from high po very to high. very high po so that they can try to bring you back to yeah. normal. Stable. So stable. it's like a fake optimal. Mm -hmm. but they do that for 18 months and then they take you off everything and see what happens, see if you relapse. Wow. And so is that what happened to you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, wow. But it took me, everyone thinks, oh, 18 months, block and replace. It took me a year to get stable. Mm -hmm. it took a year for my thyroid to get caged. It's a, you know. It was wild. Fighty, it was a fighty little wily devil. So that took a year. I really wanted to have another baby. Mm. So what they did then is they replaced my carbimazole with uh, polythyrosyl, propylthyrosyl, PTU, propylthyrosyl, which doesn't cross the placenta like carbimazole will. Um, I have no idea how this really happened. My doctor ended up being a bit of an endocrine geek, and I think I was a bit of a pet project for him. Uh -huh. Anyway, he gave me Okay. He allowed the me to be able to have a and carry a second baby so mm. had a year on carbimazole getting stable a year on propyl thyrosyl trying to get pregnant lost that baby because i was too suppressed and that's a pet hate that if you're trying to get pregnant have all of your numbers checked continuously because mm. if you're not carrying enough thyroid hormone you won't get through the first trimester mm. um and then in the third year got pregnant with the miracle child that was nine pound five out of the cat flap. Yeah. <laughs> so by that so point, then, obviously you, what, so were you stayed, on any, what, what was, what was going on medically? It was for really you interesting being pregnant as a Graves patient, mm. because what happens when you're pregnant is your immune system changes. You have some sort of immunity from your partner going on. It's like a, it's very oh, strange. Okay. So what happened was my PTU got really reduced and I didn't need it. It was really odd. And it's something I might explore next year because I'm doing immunology and cell signaling next year. So yay, pet project for me. But um, my PTU went way down and then I had the baby, all was okay. And then 10 months in, they put my PTU up a little bit gradually, but 10 months in, I had a massive relapse. I had to stop breastfeeding overnight and I went straight back onto carbimazole. And then for the next three years, I was uh, in and out of hyper, hypo, hyper, hypo. My body hated it. I went manic, uh, bipolar as a symptom, so they couldn't treat me. Yeah, wow. So one day, because when you make that much T3, for my body because of my genetics which i've explored it goes straight to my brain uh, so i was having all of these manic episodes manic visions i'd be walking my kids and i would see one of them fall in the river and drown and then realize it wasn't real it was oh wow really so you're like hallucinating hallucinations yeah um like when you you know we all think about it oh they're going to cross the road and get hit by a car but for me it was really real uh -huh. so that was fun um so I'd be playing, you know, crazy dance music, techno, 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 dancing with them. And then the next day I'd be on the floor, just suicide or working out how to kill myself without upsetting anybody. Oh, wow. So that's just scary. Like, so that is just that manic. So 
super high, super really low. manic, super high, super low. And then I hit a super, super low patch and my TSH was 20. And my doctor told me just to get on with it. Just get on with it. It's get not on that with high. What? <laughs> Why? Yeah. My TSH is 20. I'm suicidal. I can't do anything. I have two kids. Oh, wow. Um, and I, so they were three and one. Mm. Uh, no, th four and one. And um, what am I supposed to do? And he said, just get on with it. So what I did then is I literally drove across the country to my friend who's, uh, who had thyroidectomy, Graves' disease, thyroid eye disease. She's passed away now, bless her heart. But um, she just said, come to me now and drive across the country. And when you get here, I will just look after you and the kids until they will agree to increase your thyroxine which took a week for them wow. to go back and forth with bloods and and i just cried every day it was, and then i got back on the thyroxine then it was another year before i got stable enough for them to even cut my thyroid out because you can't do anything until you're stable well they won't remove so the thyroid until you're they stable won't remove it until you're stable on the med so it was back to basically it was back to the carbimazole block with the thyroxin replacement and that took it had taken a year before so it kind of took another year after that relapse to get that stable enough to cut it out by which point i was ready to just rip it, it out. out with a biro <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a, that's a long so that's what five or six years by that point of yeah, it was oh, uh, two really thousand eight diagnosed. Manage, trying to manage it, yeah, wow. really difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That must have taken a really big toll. Yeah, it really did, and I don't think I've ever really realised. I mean, it cost me um, my relationship, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it was a, it was a lot. So in my perfect Graves personality, in at the end of all that, I went to college <laughs> and, st and studied biochemistry for three years at CNM, like you do. Well, I suppose sometimes when your your health becomes all consuming, you you want to do something to try to fix it, and maybe that was that part of it. Was I want to really understand? And I want to help well, other people with it. It was, and I didn't know about the gluten thing until after my... I couldn't do anything while I was sick. Or, yeah. Well, I was still sick when they took it out, but I I came round after about three weeks of having it done. And I yeah, went that's to my next question is once you had the thyroid removed, did that, was that a game changer? Like, did that really settle yeah. things down? Yeah. Um, the thyroxine... Actually, no, it didn't, Anna. Oh, Actually, you know, thinking about it, it didn't. I, I, I thought I could still eat gluten. I'd been playing with gluten on and off. I uh, had a massive goiter. I was looking at some photos with my kids the other day, actually, and there's one of me um, with a massive goiter. I didn't know. All right, it's wow. Only because I now know. Yeah, you know what you're looking for now. And I just yeah. went, wow, I had a goiter. So when I came off the gluten, the goiter reduced. When I put it back in, it increased. And by the end, I by the time I got to surgery, it was a quarter of the size that it had been. So I do believe that I could have got myself into remission because that was only taking out the gluten. That wasn't looking at stress management. Yeah, lifestyle. wow, that was just one, one Which, aspect. That was one thing. Mm. I couldn't do anything. I, I couldn't read anything. I could, that's, you know, the book clobbing. Yeah. Interrupting for a sec, uh, just to give a shout out to my book, Let's Talk Thyroid, which is hopefully, hopefully one you are not going to want to lob across the floor because it's too complicated or too heavy. It's really written in a way to be very practical. It's very positive. Uh, if, if you flick through the inside of it, you know, you'll see diagrams and checklists, short paragraphs, lots of really easy to digest information and very practical. It's one you can dip in and dip out of depending on the aspect of thyroid health that you're working on. So you can grab it via Amazon or directly from my website, AnnabelleBateman.com. Got any questions about it, shoot me a message, but hopefully it's one of those books that's going to uh, really help you in a very practical way to start feeling good with your thyroid health. Um, 
I could, that's all I could manage. And that was a random comment by a friend of mine at, at the library for baby bounce singing. She went, oh, do we do it if you're autoimmune? And I was like, what are you talking about? And it just, boom, boom, boom. I should send her flowers, actually, because she changed my life. Yeah, wow. I wouldn't be sat here if, if it wasn't for that comment. Mm. And so after what the... what a miraculous change. I mean, you yeah. know, I think food is a... Once we've been through all the medical things and we start to look at the holistic approach, often it is diet is the first thing that is changed. It was for me too. Yeah. And I'm always, and you know, maybe a bit like you, when you're working with other people and even if all they change is gluten, and I know for a lot of people that's a massive deal, so I don't mean that in a diminishing way, um, but knowing that there are lots of other things that we can try too, if if the only change was removing gluten, Mm. it's incredible what an impact that that can make. Just that one thing. It's massive. It's yeah. it's so offensive to the gut. Um, and so for you to think, wow, you could have avoided, it's, I suppose it's a bit of a backwards crystal ball gazing activity, but in reflection, you think you could have avoided having your thyroid removed? Is that what you said? I do. Yeah. yeah I wow. do think, but I wouldn't, I, I do think I could have avoided it, but I wouldn't avoid it. I would still have trodden exactly the same path if I had my choice again. Because the amount of people I've been able to help and mm. coach and train and empower and teach is incredible. I mean, it's, it's such a gift. Mm. Didn't think it at the time, but it's a retrospective gift. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's a badly wrapped gift. Is what it <laughs> oh, that's is. a good way of putting it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it was. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't easy after the op. I, I thought I could eat gluten again, and my by this my face would just explode. I fit, I would feel like all across my eyes and down my nose would all feel like I'd been smashed in the face with a saucepan. You know, like, like a Tom and Jerry cartoon. You know, and, <laughs> and um and it took me a, like a month to catch on that maybe I should take it out again, and it went away. And the thing about Graves as well is you can have, there's two sites of attack. There's the thyroid and there's the eyes. So if the, Mm. I didn't have eye disease, thyroid eye disease. Um, Two of my friends did. It's amazing that we all got diagnosed around the same time. They have had surgery to get their eyes back into the sockets. Wow. So that's a great, that's a big distinction between Graves and Hashis, isn't it? Is the thyroid eye disease. I mean, she lost everything. She lost everything she built up, um, driving license, business, everything. Oh, wow. Um, and my other friend, she, she also had surgery, um, and she ended up with esophageal cancer, which can be a byproduct of, uh, thyroid disease as well. Um, and that's one that passed away who basically saved my life hmm. oh, bless her soul so so yeah, the gluten so impacts the bad. eyes as well i didn't know that yeah stimulate it's a it's an attack on the body isn't it it's stimulating mm, yeah. an attack and if you look at thyroid tissue and gluten molecularly they're really similar shapes and yeah. biochemistry is just about shapes it's a key and lock mechanism so if you've got a key and a lock that looks similar you're going to try and put them together and create a reaction and that's what's mm. happening so even when I eat it now because everyone thinks I'm perfect I live on kale and levitate when I meditate I don't I eat, I eat pizza <gasps> and and sometimes I go through gluten phases it makes my eyes blurry if I carry on for too long it will make my my vision blurry and then I wow. get scared and I clean up and I, and I thank God for that that I get yeah. a little Stop it. Yeah, a little <laughs> kick back into the line. <laughs> I can still get thyroid eye disease despite having no thyroid. Yeah. 20 years yeah. up to mm. surgery, you can still get this because the immune system is still active, is still confused. Just because you've had an organ chopped out doesn't mean your immune system is suddenly cured, which is what I've been told. Um, you're cured now. I'm really not. No, because the problem's with your immune system. It's not with the thyroid to start with. No, and there's a great naturopath called Harry Benjamin who I read his book from, I think it's like 1930 or something, and and it's the line I always say. I was so chuffed, and it says, you don't chop someone's head off because they have a headache. 
Uh, yeah. Do you? So why yeah. have you chopped my thyroid out? It's my immune system that's creating the damage. And that's why I get so passionate about trying to coach people into remission or which is really hard. But if we have a patient who is at risk, the first thing I say to people is take the drugs, take the drugs, please just take the drugs and we'll mop you up as we go along. Um, and if you have the operation, it's not always a guaranteed success that levothyroxine is going to work because genetically we're all different. Um, it doesn't work for me very well. Uh, my conversion rate is really, really low genetically. I'm just not able to convert levothyroxine at an optimal level. So I have a bit of levo and a bit of um, natural desiccated. Uh huh. Yeah. That's a year, two years after, maybe three years after my surgery, I was still feeling rubbish because my medication was wrong. Yeah. So it takes, I often say that it takes. It can take years. And obviously, I mean, your experience is exactly that. It can take years to find the right medical treatment and the right medication combination dosages. Well, it changes over time too. Yeah. And yes, there's a whole lot of other things that we can do alongside of it. But that side is, if you need medication, you need it. And it's really critical. Like we, we can't live without thyroid Hormones. So we, no, um, no. Yeah. So, no. so what else? So you cut out gluten, like, a, and you mentioned stress before. Are there other things that you have found from that diet and lifestyle side of managing your health, thyroid health, autoimmune health that have really worked well for you? Vitamin D was a game changer. My levels are on the floor, as most people in the UK, our levels are on the floor and nothing's yeah. done about it. They're um, not high here in Australia, even when we have lots of sun, because we're all slathered in sun sunscreen cream. and hats and covered up. Yeah. Six up so I think that's I common that. here, even when we've got the sun. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I, I heartily encourage no sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the time in a sensible moderated way like yeah. get 20 minutes on you you know uh so yeah vitamin d i did a massive loading dose with a liquid supplement mm -hmm. guided and coached by someone and um that was a game changer by that point i was slightly out of brain fog so i was able to do a listed supplement regime i pretty much self-taught everything I did I was my own guinea pig because I was still brain foggy I would have lists on my kitchen wall and times for the supplements that I had to take uh, because I could I couldn't remember anything um, I was still ill for the first kind of three years three years of my recovery I was constantly ill or um, with kind of coughs flus, uh, tonsillitis, all of that stuff. And I remember when I enrolled in my first year of, at CNM, College of Naturopathic Medicine, I only paid for the first year because me and my partner at the time, we didn't know if I'd make it because I was so sick all the time. And I think- Yeah, so taking when on I went, study when you're not well and brain fog, that's a big commitment too. It was massive. I was just, I kind of knew I had to go. I didn't know how I would do it, mm -hmm. so I just trusted. Yep. Um, and I just walked forward and just trusted. And I was on antibiotics for my first probably four months because of all the stuff that I had. Uh, so yeah, I made it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I but was so tired. Yeah. So tired. Mm -hmm. I mean, I at one point I couldn't. My, I, was, I wasn't on NDT then either. I didn't know that my thyroxine wasn't working, but I couldn't clean my teeth without having my arm on the sink because I'd have such bad muscle fatigue. Mm. And if I wanted to go for a walk with the kids, I had to sit down on the, on the floor or find a bench. Um, I'd always been a really active gym goer. I couldn't do any exercise. Uh, and then when, once I found NDT, 
Well, I started playing roller derby, so that gives you an idea of the contrast. Wow, so that was the natural desiccated <laughs> thyroid made it was that made a really big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Roller derby is yeah. a big change from not being able to brush your big teeth. Big change. Yeah. So and and that was amazing. It was amazing. And so you're still on that now? Yeah, mm. I do. Um I did used to get it from Thailand, a bit dodgy. But uh, they ran out a few years ago. There was a world shortage. Uh, of, I, I of, remember hearing about that. Yeah, I've yeah, tried it really at different annoying. point. Uh, I've tried it at some point, but it didn't really do. It wasn't great for me. It, it depends on the person. I mean, if you're adrenally adrenally challenged, so if, basically if you're a stress monkey, um, and you put that in, it can be like putting petrol on a bonfire. You need to be really careful with it. So. A lot of people, you've got to get your ducks in a row before you even put it in. You've got to make sure your iron is ready and optimal, which most of us aren't. Because mm. if anybody's having heavy periods or, you know, really regular bleeds and, and check your ferritin because your iron storage is going to be low mm. and we need it. Yeah, because there's, there's loads of other factors. Yeah, so many, there's so many factors to consider, aren't there? <laughs> so, Jules, tell us. I mean, you're, like I said at the beginning, I came across you because you're the thyroid expert. So, how did how did that come about? How, how did you was, become um, known as the thyroid expert? And what does that, you know, what's that meant to you? Oh, uh, I still get imposter syndrome. Um, I in my, I think it was my second year of te- of of studying at cnm and um the thyroid you have your thyroid endocrine lecture and i was just sitting there like holding the seat trying not to get up because he was wrong and um and in the end by this point everyone knew i had a thyroid disorder but i think i was sleeping probably halfway through the day in an office somewhere but um they said can you explain it to us can you explain it to us and i was like yeah sure so i was up there with the board you know explaining everything and then from that point onward in at cnm you do your first and your first year is pure science your second year is science plus observing case studies being taught in front of you taken in front of you with real clients your third year is more science and taking your own clients. So from that second year, when anyone had any thyroid questions, they'd come to me. And by the third year, I was the thyroid queen. I would say the princess, but apparently I was the queen. So by the time we came out, everybody would still ask me post grad, like about their thyroid clients. And, um, and I was kind of building my nutritional business. I had a massage business already and I'd started building my nutritional therapy business. I hadn't specialized in thyroid when I first started out. And then about six months in, I thought, why am I not specializing in this? Like mm. there's so many people. We're not allowed to say specializing, actually focusing. Right. Um, okay. Because you're not a medical specialist. Is that why? I'm not a medical specialist. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah. And then I got a business coach because. I invested a lot of money in the beginning because I didn't want to mess it up. I have a lot of ideas, but I'm not great at follow through, which is why this book is so hot. Um, and I didn't want to mess it up. It just felt too precious. There were so many people that needed help. I wanted to be as accessible as I could. So I got this business coach and she said, but you're an expert. So why are you not calling yourself an expert? Because I'm not good enough. Da, 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 not medically. Da, da all the voices yeah. and she said step into your space girl she said step into your space you probably you know i know more than a doctor does about thyroid disease as do you as do probably most of the listeners to your podcast um so yeah, she it's said, such an into- imposter syndrome thing though isn't it i mean and you're it. far more qualified than i am like i've got no medical or health professional qualifications and i don't yeah. obviously make out that i do but I have come to accept that I know more than your average doctor. And it took me a long time when I started to focus in and not just talk about wellness in general to own that I could be a, even it took me a long time to even say that I could even be a thyroid health coach. And I like was a life coach before anyone had ever heard of what a life coach was 20 years ago. I took my life coach training, but and then, you know, it's my naturopath friends like, Annabelle, like you are, you are a thyroid coach. Like you just, <laughs> and so now I call myself a, a thyroid 
author, advocate, and coach. That's because I think that probably captures what I do. And yeah, but I do. I I mean, and you, I understand that because for years I was like, yeah, but but I'm not medically qualified, and I no, 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 I'm not, 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 not. And that's true. I'm not those things. And there are some amazingly qualified people, but there's still doesn't no, discount no. the thousands of hours of reading and research and lived experience. So you, I'm cheering you on, thyroid queen, princess expert. You know, cellular, cellular signaling and TH1 and TH2 balancing and all of these things that endocrinologists do not even discuss because they don't know about they did it for 10 minutes in a lecture 25 years ago um it drives me nuts and my favorite clients are and i um i love coaching people for their endocrine appointments because <laughs> i say ah, they're gonna right, say this. Yeah, for going to see the endocrine they're gonna say yeah. this they're gonna do this they're gonna give you this and they come away and they go jules they did everything you said they would do and it's like because it hasn't changed in uh, 14 years, I had a client um, a few weeks ago, just a, a colleague I'm helping. She's got the same letter that was dispatched to me 10 years ago. Yeah. So here's, so here's a, a thyroid coaching question in exactly that context. And I think I mentioned this at the beginning before we started recording because beautiful lady who had been messaging me, listens to the podcast all the time, uh, and I was – just, you know, in the little Instagram chat that we were having said, well, oh, this, she's got Graves disease. And I'm like, well, Graham talking to this fabulous thyroid expert on um, uh, Graves disease tomorrow night. And she said, can I ask, have you asked a question? And I think this is perfect in this context. So her question is, um, or was, I'll slightly reword the question to make it appropriate, but I think she's feeling pressured by her endocrinologist to just do the RAI, that's the radioactive yeah. treatment. And she said, so if you're feeling pressured, um, you know, how do you defend that natural healing in the natural way? Like how, how do you, the endo's trying to push that path. She's been doing, making some incredible changes to her diet and lifestyle and seeing results in her thyroid blood tests and the way she's feeling, but still getting the pressure. So how do you, how would you coach someone in that situation to um, to deal with her next endocrinologist appointment? I hear this all the time. And I mean, it's, it's quite lucky here in the UK because the waiting lists are so long. You have, <laughs> you have so much time. I don't know what it's like. Is it like I'm that? I'm not sure, there? to be honest, in Australia. Huh? I'm not sure. So what I say to people is, um, which is probably wrong, and I'm not allowed to, but I, you may have noticed I'm a bit rookie as well. Um, put it off. If it's your body and it is your choice, and you're, especially here in the UK, operations get cancelled on the same day and relisted for weeks after. They can do that. Why can't we do that? <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's mm. like... You could, you could try what I would, what I would say to a client in this situation is tell them that you're not happy to have it right now and you want to give it another three months. What are they going to say? We're going to strike you off of our records and not operate on you or give you our AI for the next two years. I don't think legally they're allowed to do that. If you want some waiting time before your thyroid is destroyed, I think it is perfectly your right to decide when and how that's going to be destroyed. And any endocrinologist that kicks off, I just think, really? You, we're talking about a mass decision here. You're not popping a pimple. You're removing a gland that creates the entirety of the metabolism of my body. I want to have a think about it. Thank you very much. I think they're so quick to push you through the system, get you done and move on. That they, I, I know in this country, a lot of them probably don't even consider the impact because as far as surgeons are concerned the treatment works we put you on a drug and you're fixed and it's just not the case mm -hmm. it's not the yeah, case yeah and i sort of wonder and i had this little bit of conversation uh, with this lady too saying well i wonder if you know, people like her who have had that courage under the you know under fire to to not you know kind of give in straight I'm not saying give, give in is maybe not the right word but you know she's been pursuing other options she's not doing nothing yeah. 
And you know, maybe that is how over time, one endocrinologist at a time, they'll start to see, oh, well, she's done all these things yeah. and it has, and she has been able, able to slow things down or, you know, like, oh, there actually is an impact. And I wonder if over time, the yeah. more patients yeah. that have the courage to stand up for what they believe in, to try other things, not at the risk of not being reckless with their own health. And I think that was something no. you said before is, you know, if you, yeah. if we need, you know, you've got to weigh it up. Like, you know, how, how bad are you feeling? You know, how bad are you feeling? And if you yeah. need that help, you do. And is it, is it an overactive Graves client or is it a cancer client or is it, it's got to be completely unique. If, if it's a nodule that's sticking out of your, um, neck which i've had a lovely lady she actually flew back to australia to get that removed oh right it wasn't it wasn't dangerous she was australian oh, <laughs> she didn't okay. just pop over. um but for her the fear that it might turn malignant even though it was a nodule was too big for her and was creating stress and impacting on the rest of her body so we weighed up well what's going to make you content here you know if with removing it and the risk of being on levo is is the thing or or are you going to live with this fear and she went and got it removed and she's been happy as any, anything ever since she got married shortly after with this beautiful scar she was so proud of this scar because it meant that she had taken her house she was empowered and she chose that and mm. why shouldn't we yeah. they weren't they probably will never change their practice uh because of guidelines and there's no money in research for thyroid, it all goes into diabetes. We can't change the system, but we can change active, engaged patients. And that's the difference is we're gonna have to be the ones that go, hang on a minute, I want another three months. And that's gonna be okay, you yeah. know? We have to find our voices. And it's shocking because we're so vulnerable as patients. We're brain fogged, we're fatigued, we're confused. We have no energy to fight. And they won't allow anyone in with us most of the time to fight for us either. Yeah. It is hard. I mean, you immediately put in that you are in a very vulnerable position. Like I had a similar thing. I had a brain lesion um, a couple of years ago. About seven, uh, it was just before I turned 40. I'm just turned 48. So, uh, and yeah, the, the first, basically I was told I should be going on steroids and and I was like, oh, I just don't know if I want to do that. And the neurologist said, well, here's, here's the information. You should make an appointment with the nurse, you know, to talk about it. And I never did that. And I, you know, but I've gone every, it started six monthly and now it's about 18 monthly for MRIs and appointments. And so same doctor, really lovely neurologist. But every time I see him and I'm due to see him in about three weeks, um, he's like, oh, and Annabelle, you never went on those steroids. And I said, and so it's the same conversation we've had now for, you know, seven or eight years. And I said, no, but you have to know that I haven't done nothing. <laughs> you have to know that yeah. it's not that I just didn't go on steroids. <laughs> I've taken a very active approach to reducing inflammation everywhere in my body in every way yeah. I can. So I think that, and, and he's like, oh, well, well, he's got to the point where it's like, well, A, he said probably about three or four years ago, um, you know, it's a good thing you never went on those steroids because you would have had three or four years of steroids when you didn't really need them. And, and he, yeah, I know. And he said, actually, you know, I think the drug companies are a bit, and he sort of paused and I said, I can't remember what I said now. And he said, disingenuous. And I'm like, wow, okay. Um, cause he said, I just think they're, you know, they really push that you go on the drugs early and I'm like, oh, I bet they do. <laughs> and so I think, wow, well, like, I don't know how many patients he's got like me, you know, um, but he's got to the point where it's like, well, while it's, you know, while it's still working, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And I said, look, I'm happy to reassess it. If I end up with other lesions, you know, I, I I'm not an idiot. I'm happy to reassess things, but it, I, yeah. the more natural I can be, the better you know the that's my preferred approach and so far it's it's 
I haven't had any other lesions and, and he's like a bit puzzled. And I think, well, that's good. So now I've got a puzzled neurologist who's seen now for hopefully like in a couple of weeks, eight years worth of not needing steroids. And look, maybe in fact, who knows? Like I'm not, you know, I believe I'm healed of it, but I'll reassess things if, if something changes. And I think, yes, if this um, other lady I was talking to is, is made incredible changes with diet and lifestyle, Maybe this is how we change the system is just one patient at a time. Yeah, absolutely. And who knows? Let's just pray into that those two consultants find the magic of functional medicine training. And yeah. actually Wouldn't that be amazing? The way that they practice would yeah. be amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So Jules, tell me about the thyroid collective. Oh, my babies. <laughs> um, so... I have been trailblazing alone, it feels like, for quite a few years. And I couldn't see enough people. I was waiting listed for, for quite a few months for some patients. And I hated the thought that there were people out there ready and willing, because it's a big jump to actually give your health to somebody else and, and do what's asked of you. It's really, it's a lot. Um, despite our amazing coaching and a baby step at a time way of doing things because we're all thyroiders so we know how brain fogged and fatigued everyone is uh so i've always wanted an army always always ever since that first support group ever since my operation and my levo didn't work but i didn't know ever since i felt so rubbish for so long and started at college i thought i yeah this, there's a lot of work to do. So I started um, talking about it one day with a colleague in my uh, thyroid support group that we kind of ended up facilitating together. I was the main facilitator, but she'd always come. That's Lou. And she's an occupational therapist. And then I said, I want an army one day. And um, she said, let's build it. She's now just taking a sabbatical for two years from work so she can finish her training at CNM. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I, what happened? How did I recruit? So many people ask me if they can work with me. And no, basically, <laughs> really ruthless. One, you have had to have had a thyroid problem. Don't ask me if you haven't had a thyroid problem. You have to be a warrior and have come out the other end. That's the primary requirement. Um, but yeah, the first the first time I started really actively putting it together was 2019. And I started coming across these amazing practitioners that would phone me for coaching. And I'd see how amazing they'd been. And then I'd be like, hmm. I don't suppose you'd want to join the army. So two of them came to me through that. Another one I saw, uh, I just followed her for a while thinking, wow, she's on fire. You know, when you see a practitioner, they're just like, just, they've just got it. They've hit the ground running. They're so, and all of them are so, they've outgrown me already. Their knowledge is far superior to mine. Um, they've all got their little different uh, niches as well. We've got CFS and ME and had just hashies and complex autoimmunity with one of them's got like three autoimmune diseases herself mm -hmm. you know but all thyroid i get very excited about my team so um there are eight all together one step down because she's doing some amazing stuff with the institute for um i can't remember what it's called like naturopathic medicine um, which is great because we've got a little inroad there. Um, but the rest of them, Lou's nearly qualified, which is great. And then the other, I'm dyscalculia, so I don't know how many others there are. So, four, four, I'm one of them. So, yeah, four, five. Anyway, I've lost count. They are fully booked all the time. And we just and are they lovely... all naturopathic nutritionists like yes. you? Or are they, yeah. Some are CNM, some are ION. So we've got that nice mix as well. And when we have our geek offs, we try and get together like every one or two months on Zoom and we have a geek off. And we'll bring maybe case studies or we'll talk about marketing or but whatever it is, we have 
our little geek off and we've also got our whatsapp group so we're all like looking at people's results anonymously um but we're always oh it's, it's amazing i would love to expand it but the process for integrating new people in the team is very lengthy because i am so fussy about who i work with <laughs> which yeah. is so it's my army but um there's loads of amazing thyroid practitioners out there but it's the first time i think there's there's one in ireland but there's it's the first time a team has come together to work together on one specific health condition and it mm. will grow I just can't do it right now. Yeah. Um, and are you, you you're all in the UK? Yeah, we're all spread out across the country, okay. which is also really nice. But we're all Zoom as well. No one's really. So do, do you only like you all see clients on Zoom? Is anyone face to face? Are you all? It's all. Yeah, online? no one's gone back. No, it's just the yeah, accessibility. And as Caroline said, I did a load of interviews with each of them that, that were all on YouTube. She went, the thing is, everyone's just knackered. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, it is even just physically getting into an appointment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Physically getting to an appointment. I know for a lot of my clients was always tricky to, mm. to get your jammies off and look presentable to go in the world. Like yeah. The beauty of Zoom has opened up a whole bigger and better playground. I was doing Zoom before COVID because I had clients all over the world, which was amazing. So, and we still do that. We have mm. literally a worldwide clinic between us all, yeah. which is just amazing. I just well, wish I could. Well, that's what's really good about the it. internet is you can find people. Like I found you, you know, that was just through Google yeah. search. So if there are other patients looking for that all over the world, then you're going to come up in a lot of searches regardless yeah. of where people are searching from. So it's, um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. And are you able to, uh, I'm just not sure what, what the qualifications mean in terms of Australian you know, equivalents. Are you able to, do you do sort of supplements and can you refer for blood tests and all of that type of thing? Is that? Yeah, yeah. We don't see anyone without a blood test. So we have full blood panels taken before you even get into clinic with us. Yeah. Um, and then we have access to obviously gut panels, genetics. We do a lot of genetic testing as well, looking at, and it's just thyroid genetics or just mm. nervous system genetics. So there's none okay. of that scary bracket mean stuff that, or you're going to find out that your dad's Darth Vader. There's nothing <laughs> scary. It's specific system analysis, mm. which is fantastic. And, and once you know, you know, with genetics, I love genetics. Um, so yeah, we do bloods, we do genetics, we do nutraceuticals, so supplements, um, we do lifestyle changes, massive lifestyle changes, massive food changes, but we take it all compartmentalize everything. So it's manageable. Um, it has to be naturopathic. It has to be the whole picture. There's no point giving a single mum with low income, a, like a super expensive organic kale based diet for her and her child when her child lives on spaghetti hoops and she's at a food bank. So yeah. we work with everyone who has literally barely any money to loads of money. Um, and we fit each single plan for each session for each client. So um, there's a lot of rabbits pulled out of hats for lots of clients, which I love. There's, you know, there's the basics, like we gut heal and we reduce inflammation and we generally get people off gluten, possibly dairy, dependent on the person. So there's that basic stuff, but it's all the things around it that make it really holistic. Like, how are you going to do that? Yeah. So, yeah, well, and that's, and that's the keeping it. I call it the, you know, KISS principle, keep it super simple, yes. you know. It's got to be simple. It's got to it's be got that. To be and simple. that's, I mean, look, that's sort of a large part of, I mean, I'm not working with people individually in that way, but that's what I've tried to do in my book. And so at the end mm. of it, it's very much the practical, how do we do this? And well, what's one thing you can do? Like what's the next step? Um, yes. Keep it super simple. And, and I think a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of books that tell you the, the why <laughs> you need to do this, you need to cut out gluten, but no one really tells you how. And why? so that's what I've tried to do in my book is there's a bit of why, but then the, the, the focus is on the how because, and the how for you might be slightly different to the how for me, but what's one thing you can do? Just one thing. Like, yeah, the yeah one like thing. if you're living, you know, if you're having a bacon sandwich every day, 
switch it to gluten-free bread, I'll tell you a really good one, and go naked bacon with no nitrates. You know, take a food plan and fit it to the person, even if it's only for the first month. Yeah. Yeah. You know, really, really simple. And if there's any more, that I'm a terrible um, at teaching year two clinic because if you've got any more than like five or six things on your plan you failed your client they are exhausted they're coming to you for help and you're going to give them a 30 page report no one's going to read that yeah. five things five things so um because i teach clinical nutrition for the the second the third year when they're taking their own clients i go in and make sure they're not killing anyone <laughs> Yeah, that, that's kind of important. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I love that idea. I, I love the sound of, you know, just, yeah, of, oh, well, I love the, the name, the Thyroid Collective as well. Like, you know, I love the way mm. that that just sounds very collaborative. And one of the things that I've loved about the podcast is I've got to c connect with people like you in, well, I say all around the world, a lot of it's in, in America, some in Australia, and only a couple Maybe I'm just beginning my foray into the UK. One day I can do a whole world tour of my thyroid friends around the world, <laughs> yeah. which I would love. Um, a world convention. I know. How good would that be? But I don't want to, I want to do it in person. And so that really leads into the final thing I just want to talk to you about, because I know we've been going for a while and people don't have lots of attention because we're all brain fogged <laughs> and tired. But um, so just something that I've not really stood out to me when I was reading about you on your website was the way you've gathered people like right from mm -hmm. sounds like right from the beginning and building to me, I've got a whole chapter in my book on building a thyroid support team. So, and that's yeah. chapter thyroid basics. It's chapter two. Um, right at the beginning, you need a support team <laughs> and that can be a whole range of things, but I, you have gathered people in person for support groups and conferences, and now you're gathering practitioners. So what is it about gathering <laughs> people that's important to you in this thyroid space? Oh, I'm a gatherer. I am a gatherer of people. I, I like a tribe. I've always liked a tribe. I think ancestrally we're built to be in a tribe. Um, we would have been sitting around the fire. I probably would have been mashing up some herbs for a nice cup of tea for us that was beneficial and nutritional for us. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in tribe and um, not everyone can afford the prices we charge for nutritional therapy. And that was something I was passionate about from the beginning. I've always undercharged in comparison to what I could charge. There's people out there making so much money from nutritional therapy, which is great. Fair play if that's the way you want to do it. But there's so many. The thing with thyroid dysfunction is you lose a lot and a lot of people lose their confidence, but they lose their finances and they lose their support systems because it's very isolating being that sick. Uh, so a tribe for thyroid is, is even more important and having accessible information is even more gold dust important. Um, and there is nothing better than face to face communication and hugs, because when we hug each other, oxytocin is released has to be 20 seconds oxytocin is released we de-stress and we actually feel what we're feeling and a lot of that is grief and loss and fear and confusion and you can't portray that really in a book um or or anything else yeah. it's, it's a face-to-face -face. uh so the thyroid support group that we're hoping to resurrect it actually here in the UK um, was like a drop in for people. Doesn't matter what you've got, doesn't matter if you say anything, but just come and be, mm. just come and sit, have a cup of tea and be with us. Uh, so we can't, you know, so you know that you're not alone. And that's really important. There is nothing worse than feeling like you're all on your own, going mad, not knowing. So, that was the first thing that I res resurrected was the thyroid support group. The second thing I did was the first thyroid conference, which was 2000, we did 2017, 2009, 2018, 2019, I had to take a break because I burned out. <laughs> no surprise there. That's the thing is that and sometimes then, we take on too and much. And then COVID happened. Yeah. 
So, um, but the first conference was amazing. We had about 60, 70 people. We had uh, short, sharp speakers for 30 minutes, 45 minutes sessions. So people didn't get fall asleep. Um, it was a fantastic day. We did it again the next year, another fantastic day. Uh, so that went really well. But in parallel to that, I've always done, um, it's called the thyroid talks. So it would be a couple of hours of an evening in a, um, I was going to say facility, that sounds bad, <laughs> in an event space yeah. uh, with, with snacks, very important. Um, and I would just give a brief presentation for 45 minutes about what the thyroid is, where it is. I didn't even know it was in my neck. Did yeah. you? I just didn't even know where it was. Yeah. That rundown that we talked about at the beginning of what it is, what it does, how it goes wrong, and what you can do, basics for what you can do to fix it. Very similar to your book, by the sounds of things. And then you could just hang out afterwards and have more snacks and a cup of tea and just chat to other patients or to me or to one of my um, practitioners, actually three of my practitioners have helped me with that talk, which is really nice because they're in Bristol. So, um, and they're not my practitioners, I must add. They're very autonomous. They don't work <laughs> they're your for collective. Right? They're long, <laughs> That's your collection. <laughs> collection of uh, So I've just gathered them. They mm. do their own thing. Um, so just to be in that space with other patients, I think is really important. And also, if you can't afford nutritional therapy, come along to a talk, it's like 10 quid, um, and you've got your basics mm. met, and you have connections, and you can meet with other people. With the collective, it was so important to gather people that are just so passionate about it, and and the, the mine that we have between us that we uh, it's just gold i mean there's so much experience within and they've not all been practicing for ages and ages and ages but the experiences that they've had the experiences with clients that they've had their teachings are all different according to which college they've been at um they research in different ways they've got different passions they're being coached as well by other people not just me so they're getting all that, you know, we've had one that's done Datis Karazian's teachings. No, see, he's my favourite. I've done lots of, I've done his thyroid practitioner's exactly. course. Exactly. We, yeah. we have all these geek, we share all of our information. It's like, can you imagine? <laughs> Seven of us all geek. Yeah, I'd out. love that. That sounds like, I want to be invited to that oh, dinner party. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So, and it's our tribe, you I, know. I, I think you're an Aussie collective by default person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll bring you in. Bring you in. <laughs> just, I just want to chat with you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, I love that. And, uh, you know, if you are listening and you feel alone, you're not alone. And maybe, you know, I, I do say, I say this from time to time, is if you feel like you're alone, one of the things that I think you can do is start to talk about your own thyroid story with other people because one in eight women have a thyroid condition. So yeah. odds are, if you start to talk about it, you'll find someone else and then you're not alone, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, look at the world we live in. We're so connected. Start yeah. a Facebook group, meet up. How many women in your area are going to have, you know, just go for a coffee in a cafe. I guarantee like three people will turn up. Yeah. Even if there's no one at our thyroid support group before COVID, if I was the only one and Lou was the only one, that's fine. Because I bet you anything, that day I'm having an off day and I need to offload I don't go there as a practitioner. I go there as a patient. And some days I've gone, you know what? I feel really rubbish today. Um, I keep forgetting to take my medication or, you know, the, the heat is killing me. I think I'm over medicated because I have to change mine sometimes seasonally. Uh -huh. So, but just being able to voice that to people that, that get it is critical. If we mm. were all living as we are designed to live, <laughs> without tech and without you know within community we would be together wouldn't we yeah well we, we might not be that diseased because we'd be eating berries and leaves yeah look <laughs> yeah that's a whole nother conversation that's a whole new, <laughs> that's that's a whole new thing yeah the that's a whole new thing but yeah, but yeah i suppose it's just that you know think. that you're not alone and if you feel alone, alone reach out to someone i mean reach out to that me you know Yep, come join the group. group. So, 
Yeah. Go for a decaf oat latte. Yeah. So, Jules, um, where can people contact you or the Thyro Collective if, if someone's looking for the kind of services that your company offers? I know you're about to go back into full-time student mode and – I'm just going to say this one when your when your book is finished I will get you back on the show because I want to hear all about it I want to read it um, and we will promote it so but until then like how would you like people who uh, people to con be yeah, in contact with you and or your collective I uh, have a Facebook page no I have well, I do have a Facebook page I don't know what it's called but everything is on the website yeah um, which is the thyroidexpert.com on there is my Instagram at the top right. You just need to click on the Insta or the Facebook or the YouTube. There's quite a lot of stuff on YouTube, which I'll be rolling out more over the summer as well, hopefully when I get time. Just some short, sharp, quick um, videos on what to do. Little things like if I go for a run, I take salt in my water afterwards and like little tricks like that, balancing electrolytes, just little um, nuggets of information. That's on Facebook as well. There is a sneak peek of the book on Instagram that I put on yesterday. Uh, I'm not. Oh, I didn't see it. I'll have to have a no, look. Yeah, yeah. I got my laptop to read it back to me, which was quite cool. So a sneak peek. But yeah, I'm easily emailable. And that's all on the website as well. Excellent. Well, I'll make sure I've got all of that linked in the show notes and on social media so people can connect. But I want to thank you, Jules, for your time tonight well it's tonight for me today for you i um you know i know you know thyroid experts are busy people and and i appreciate that you have such passion for the thyroid community at large that you would take a, an hour and uh, and a bit more and and chat with me and share your story your personal story as well as the work that you do with your thyroid patients so thank you so much Oh, thank you. It's been an absolute blessing spending time with you today. And it's been great. Yeah, it's been really nice. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Let's Talk Thyroid. I would love it if you enjoyed it. If you would hit subscribe and the bell, that would be really helpful. Uh, even more helpful actually would be to share it with someone else who you know has thyroid issues or you think would benefit from listening. That really is part of my mission, I suppose, is to spread the message of positive and practical approach to managing your thyroid health so that people really kind of have more energy to get on with living their life and not just some kind of trudging through each day. So spreading that word really genuinely helps um, other people feel better, live better, be better. Uh, the best way that you can connect with me is through my um, website, which is annabellebateman.com. From there, really, you'll be able to connect in all the other ways. I would love it if you would join my Facebook community group. Um, there's lots of uh, great support there. It's all free. Uh, that and that's you know just being with like-minded people uh, but from the website you can also book a strategy session with me so if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed not sure not too sure where to start then um, book a strategy session there's also freebies to download and links to look at my online courses or purchase some essential oils or or, one, or my cookbook so that's really the hub would be annabellebateman.com but look forward to connecting with you and um, yeah just being in this thyroid health journey together have a great day bye the information presented and discussed in this podcast is not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease and should not be used as a substitute for proper advice from a qualified professional